Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Excellent. So my name is David Beard. I'm with Buforia. Um, we are an AR SDK, an AR development platform, AR being augmented reality. And my talk today is going to um, really concern the development of the next generation of augmented reality applications that will be able to be experienced and executed in real world environments, in everyday environments. So what I'm going to talk about, this session really is going to concern um, the nature of the technology, what are some of the design principles that you should be aware of, what are the opportunities for both designers and also developers in this new area of augmented reality, and then giving some principles and design considerations for how to approach the creation of an augmented reality experience that you would execute in the real world. And this is an emerging area. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is really where have we been um, with augmented reality? What's available today? How is that changing? What's enabling that? What kinds of devices and what kinds of technologies? And then where are we going and when might that happen? And how can you be prepared for that? What, what should you know in order to be able to create these experiences? So the basic principle of augmented reality is that using a camera, you can recognize the world around you, you understand the contents of the world, maybe some information about the scene that you're viewing, and then you know where those things are in relation to the user. It's called a pose. You know where this thing is in relation to the person who's in the experience. And when you know that, it enables you to then register virtual content onto a real world subject whether it's an object or some element of the environment. So that's really what augmented reality is. It's, it's a pretty simple concept with a lot of advanced technology supporting it. And that, at, at Vuforia, that's what we do. We provide an SDK that makes it very easy for people to create augmented reality experiences without needing to know the underlying mathematics or computer vision or some of the sensor um, techniques that are used. We really focus on making augmented reality simple for people. Um, and that's why we like Unity, is a lot of our mission is really to democratize AR, to make it easy to allow people to focus on their creative vision and to, to really focus on what, they want, to, what they, they want to accomplish and what they want to create more so than the mechanics and technical aspect. So we've been around for a while, about six years now. A lot of AR apps in the market. A lot of people have been successful creating AR using the current generation of technology. I'd like to show you some examples of that so you know where we've been, and then I'm going to talk about what's coming. So augmented reality has really been on mobile devices. You'll see handheld devices, tablets, things like smartphones, um, but also head-mounted displays, what we call eyewear. And you'll see a lot of it has been in the consumer space. So it's, it's things like marketing, um, casual games, retail applications, things like that. And then also enterprise. AR actually started in the enterprise um, for very practical applications like delivering instructions or inspecting things. And then as smartphones became more powerful, it crossed into the consumer space. We actually have a lot of these demos at our table, if you'd like to see them after that. But as you can see, again, toys, um, a big area of adoption, and then just other practical applications in retail and marketing. So, the current generation of AR has really focused on recognizing and augmenting with virtual or digital content the range of 3D physical objects, um, but also 2D images, things like text, and also you've probably seen maybe fiducial markers or things like QR codes. It's, it's essentially a marker type that encodes information, but it's also recognizable for the purpose of tracking. And we provide a technology called a ViewMark that does that. It's a customizable way of encoding information into things. So that's where we've been. Really, for the past six years, before he's focused on developing this technology, refining it, making it very robust and easy to use. What's coming, um, which you may have seen, is a new generation of depth 
sensing devices. And we, we refer to this as depth integration because it uses a variety of methods and uses depth in different ways. But really, the change is that beyond simply being able to recognize something that you've defined, it has an ability to map the environment. And that means it can create a three-dimensional map or mesh of the physical environment around you. So what's currently available are the Tango device by Google, which you've probably heard about. Um, that actually uses an active IR method. It scans the environment by projecting a laser onto surfaces. And it creates a very accurate uh, point cloud of the surface. And then it stitches that together, and it gives you a three-dimensional mesh of the surfaces in your environment. Uh, also, HoloLens, obviously, they're here. Uh, HoloLens takes a similar approach using an active scanning method. It also integrates positional tracking, but it does it as a form of eyewear, right? So it incorporates a display that enables you basically to, as an HMD, to wear the experience effectively. Tango is handheld, and HoloLens is really a head-worn experience. Uh, the newcomer, which you've probably seen just a couple weeks ago, is obviously ARKit, right? So this has been introduced by Apple. It's really for iOS 11. Primarily A9 devices, but it can, features can be used with um, lower end devices. But the difference here is that where Tango and HoloLens are focused on very accurate reconstruction, as we call it, of the environment, creating a very accurate geometry, ARKit is a bit different. It's really focused on handheld devices, consumer devices. And what ARKit allows you to do is to understand where there are planar surfaces, like the floor or this Diaz here, the stage, or maybe this edge of something. And so it'll give you a collection of, of surfaces that you can use to augment things, like whatever that creature is. So you can say, oh, I'd like to put a panda bear on the floor in front of me. And you can tap the screen. It projects a ray into the environment. And then you can augment that. And you can actually walk around it. And I'll explain how they're, how they're doing this. But I think the thing to recognize as a developer is these are all using sort of a similar family of technologies. So that as you get into this area, if you're interested in creating AR for real world environments, it's good to understand how these are compatible and how they're differentiated so that you could create an app that potentially could run on Tango and also HoloLens and also maybe be graded so you could run it on ARKit. It really gives you the broadest audience possible. And that's some of the design principles I'm going to talk about will help you understand how to, how to approach that. So the devices in the market currently are obviously the uh, iPhones, right? So ARKit has really been announced in promotion with things like the 7 Plus, um, but it also, it'll work really with any of the A9 devices. Uh, the Tango is working currently with the Lenovo Fab. There's also an Asus device that's available. And then obviously HoloLens is HoloLens. It's its own product. So what's enabling all this? This is where there's some commonality in the technology. Really, what's happening is you're using a combination of computer vision, also inertial sensing, and in many cases, you're using an active IR depth sensing technology. So the, the CV primarily runs off of really standard cameras. It's using RGB cameras, often black and white cameras, often wide angle cameras. So when you look at a Tango or you look at the HoloLens, you'll notice that it has a, a, a variety of cameras. It's not like a standard smartphone or tablet where it has cameras that are specifically dedicated to sort of capturing a wide field of view often in black and white, and extracting useful features from that so that it understands both your movement and also has a sense of the depth of your surroundings. Right? Um, what it, you're doing then is you're combining that with information from the IMU, which is an inertial measurement unit, and often you're using an active scanning method. Tango and HoloLens use IR. Uh, ARKit, the, I, the iPhone doesn't. They're purely using uh, a combination of RGB cams and IMUs. They're using the sensors, basically. And this is what I'm describing. So there's really the domain of what's called visual inertial odometry, right? This is using standard computer vision and inertial measurement units. Visual inertial odometry means you're using visual, iner visual information, inertial information from the movement, the acceleration of something. And it, you have an understanding of how you're moving through the environment. If you look at the output of a visual inertial odometry system, it actually understands the trajectory, the path that you're walking through your setting. So that understands movement. The other component is depth sensing. And this is acquired either using IR or using a technique that's called SLAM, which is simultaneous localization and mapping. The significant thing to understand is both of them will give you a sense of the shape of, your of the surroundings. It'll give you geometry. It'll give you a map. And so 
The technique is known as sensor fusion. In order to understand where a user is in relation to the geometry of their setting, you fuse the knowledge of their motion, of their position, with a knowledge of the geometry, and that gives you the position of the user in relation to their geometry. So when, we talk, when you look at applications that, let's say you're creating an air experience for Tango for HoloLens, and it has that ability to know how, like if you're going to put content onto a surface, and it understands how to position the content relative to you, it's because it's using that, both a knowledge of the shape of the surface and also your position to correctly augment that content. That's the basic technique. It's not that simple, but that's what they're doing. So what this results in, to sort of understand the range of capabilities that are available, that are becoming available today, is you can consider it almost as a form of geometric accuracy or geometric fidelity. In the simplest form, you have techniques that enable you to just find a plane. And you probably, if you've seen the Snap app, where you can go and you can put a sad cloud onto something or a unicorn. And what you're just doing is it's finding a flat surface and enabling you to raycast against it and put something and to sort of understand how you move in that environment. That's the simplest element. As you get more advanced, you can start adding multiple planes. It can extract this surface versus that versus the floor versus maybe a wall, depending on what you're using. Beyond that, you start having a notion of edges, right? And this is what's happening here is as you move up in capabilities, you're typically adding another sensing capability. The simplest form can be done with a, really just an RGB camera and inertial sensor. As you get into things like multiple planes and plane extents, it means that you're, you're probably using a, a specialized camera set or a specialized fusion technique, right? So simple, a little more sophisticated. Extents mean that you find edges on things right in the top row. This is very useful. You'd like to know if you have a character in a game that he's walking off the table or he's bumped into something. That's what extents are going to give you. It's like an edge, right? Um, beyond that, you start getting into methods that require either an active scanning technique like IR or a lot of user motion. And this is where objects as boxes, for example, means that you can construct the volume of something. It means that for this pedestal here, you would actually know the volumetric dimension of it so that in your augmented reality app, you could have this occlude some of your content. Like if I was standing behind it, you would know to actually occlude me as a character, or you can have things bump into it. But it basically gives you a parameter for the volume of something. As you get more sophisticated, and this now is involving typically IR, it's, it's either stereo or IR where you're actually scanning, getting a very accurate geometry. Um, this gives you a, a, an accurate reconstruction of the actual shape of something. So this would tell me that the pedestal has an angle to it or that these are actually angled boxes rather than volumetric boxes. If you scanned a person, you would get the shape of a person rather than a, a big bulb around them. Um, in the extreme, you have what is full mesh reconstruction, the yellow one on the far side. That's what you get as a raw output from something like a Tango or a HoloLens. And a lot of developers make the mistake of thinking, oh, well, if I'm developing an AR experience, don't I want the most accurate representation? Don't I want the most resolution possible? The truth of the matter, that's very difficult to work with because it's like a big soup of polygons, right? There's really nothing. All you're getting is a relief of the surface, but you don't know what you're looking at. This is really where Vuforia comes in and some of the other techniques that are being used um, by developers to sort of structure that representation and separate it out into useful components. So I'll talk about that a little bit. So I think in thinking about this area, the most fundamental, as I mentioned, is really the sensing technology. And this is typically in hardware. And this is IR sensors, cameras, inertial measurement units, IMUs. Once you have those, you take the output, you integrate it together, and it gives you a sense of the depth and the, the scale of your environment. And it enables you to create accurate reconstructions of things. But once you have that, that geometry, you need to turn it into a mesh in order to work with it, in Unity, for example. So what you'd like is a polygonal model of the environment. That's called tessellation. You stitch it all together, you create a set of polygons, and you return that to the developer. But now that you've got that, as I, you saw the big yellow blob of things, it's not actually that easy to work with, and it's very intensive to keep that in memory and process it as you start trying to navigate the environment. So what you'd actually like to do is segment that into useful components. And what this means, let's say I scan my stage here. I'd like to know that the stage is actually independent of the pedestal. So I segment that. I cut it off and create one mesh here and another mesh there. And then I'd like to know that the, this stage is different from the floor. So I cut the stage away, and I cut the floor away. And now I have 
a simple object for the floor, for the stage, and another one here, and now I can do something, right? Now I can isolate these and use them independently within my application. That's the significance of segmentation. But then once we have segmented objects, I'd like them to be usable and sort of, let's say that I'm not interested in a smooth reconstruction. I don't need to know the shape. I just need to know what's there. I want, a, I want a volume or a box around it. That's what structure does. It says turn it into a plane, turn it into a box, or turn it into something simpler that I can work with that I already know how to, how to manipulate. So that's structure. Above that, you have all of these objects. Let's say we scan the entire room. I had all of you. I have the walls. I have the, the floors. Again, it's a big mess. So what do I do with it? I'd like to take it and actually map this now into some kind of a graph representation or some kind of a logical structure that I know I, know I can work with so that programmatically in my application, I can reason about what I'm working with. I know that something like this bottle is on top of the pedestal, and I can call that a child. If I would say, find me the pedestal, and then find me all children of the pedestal. I'd like to do something. I'd like to manipulate them. That is how you could discover the bottle. But it means that you have to have a data structure that organizes all of these parts and kind of brings them into a useful representation of the environment. That's something before it does as well. And then the, the most abstract element, as you look at these, this obviously increases in abstraction, is once you have organization, you can apply reasoning. And what this means is, it's actually simple. Making queries about things like, find me all objects that are at least two meters square. Or find me all surfaces that are horizontal to the gravity vector, that are the floor, basically. Find me all elements that are within 10 feet of me, right? Those are basic queries. And this is what this kind of structure allows you to do. And it also allows you to navigate the graph. And then it's, again, to say, find me everything that's sitting on the floor. And you can make a query and derive any element that has that relationship to the floor. So when you look at this, this really then falls into a couple of domains. The, the bottom layers are what we call reconstruction. We're reconstructing the geometry of the environment to create a useful mesh, right? And then once you have that, you need an understanding of the mesh, and that's referred to as scene understanding. Scene understanding is really looking at the contents of the world that have been reconstructed and sort of organizing them and separating them so that you know their significance and you know exactly, you sort of know the contents of what you're looking at. Scene understanding takes a lot of forms, but it, it basically deals with this. Segmenting, structuring things, organizing, and then having the ability to, to sort of reason about them. And reasoning really means to apply programmatic, using logic to programmatically reason about things. Um, and these are typically implemented at the lower level in hardware and at the upper levels in software, right? And before it kind of focuses on really that, that blue element. We, we look at taking the result of a Tango or a HoloLens or an AR kit and making it useful for developers by structuring it and turning it into a, a, an organization that's useful. So let me show you some examples. We have this demo at our booth, um, and I encourage you to come by. But I'm going to talk about you know, some of the design challenges in this area and some of the opportunities for developers. This is very new, so I, I can't really tell you how to do it. The, the challenge when you get into building an AR experience for a real world environment is you're really turning your app over to the user and saying, here, you execute this experience, right? I'll give you some instruction, but maybe it's a game. Maybe you want a character to run up here and jump onto something, jump up to the pedestal, and then shoot me or something, right? So how do you instruct a user to even set that up? And you have to, this is really the significance of user experience and understanding how to organize the environment so that it's approachable to somebody because the user doesn't know necessarily even what your intent is, right? So how do you provide them with the type of user experience and instruction that enables them to do that? So this is using Tango and it combines that with what are called image targets. So we're able to recognize those images and then we give them a significance within the gameplay, right? Each of them have a different role and execute different kinds of actions within a game. And the game is it's sort of basically about discovering things on Mars. Let's think of it that way. So there's a hazard on Mars, which is the fissure. You need to bring in a drone to then navigate the environment. The drone then activates scanning. You'll see there's a mesh being built up. And what this does is it, it lets you know the difference between the horizontal and vertical surfaces. And the logic here is it just finds a vertical surface and then scans it and turns it into ice. And so the Mars mission is to go and find ice on Mars so we can colonize it and get off Earth. Astronaut comes out. 
And now because we've created a mesh of the environment, the astronaut is able to navigate through that environment. So she discovers the ice and then chips away at it. So that's the basic experience that was developed for Tango using Vuforia and in Unity. So this is something that we're, we're making available very soon. And you'll have an opportunity using the FAB or the ASUS device to start creating these experiences. And again, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's over at our booth. But you, know, you can see applying these to a range of gaming experiences uh, or gaming use cases, shopping. And then there's a lot of interest in enterprise, which is really very practical, like delivering instructions or enabling people to provide remote assistance or just diagnose things or inspect things. Very practical applications. So when you think about the design challenges, and these are, these are relevant really to almost all forms of applications, but they really break down into the user experience that you need to define, the kind of workflow that the user needs to execute. This is something that's somewhat special for AR because, again, you're asking the user to go into the real world and execute an experience that you've designed for them, right? So it's a little bit different. They have to set things up in a way that they can successfully execute your game or whatever it is you're trying to present to them. Um, those are the human factors. Those are the things that a human has to understand and actually do. Uh, the machine factors are obviously the hardware that's provided. It's the sensing technology. Um, and also algorithms, which are typically in software but may be embedded in hardware. These are, are typically concealed from the developer. So a lot of the focus of the developer is obviously in the human factors. It's defining, designing an effective experience and designing a workflow that the user can successfully execute the experience. The big difference, obviously, for AR is we need to be very conscious of the environment. The behavior of the application can change based on the environmental conditions. Um, specifically, CV is sensitive to light conditions. Things like IR are sensitive to outdoor illumination or very black surfaces. So there are things that you have to be aware of that you wouldn't for you know, a typical game, a video game or something. Um, a good way of thinking about this is that there are certain envelopes that are optimal for the execution and design of an AR experience. These typically, these really concern the illumination, which is the lighting condition. There is sort of a range that is good. You don't want a very dark area. You don't want a very bright area. Both of those conceal information from the camera, right? So that's pretty logical. Um, the other is just the ranges that you're executing on. So what happens with active scanning is it's tuned often for something like an arm's length experience out to maybe 10 feet. HoloLens, I think, is good for 12. But you have to understand, like, if I'm asking the user to go into the environment and design the environment to execute gameplay, that I should tell them, look, do this so everything is within five feet. You know what I'm saying? Or if they need to move, if, if they're doing something that's in a larger area that they need to move between positions so that you always have the subject matter within the range of the cameras. Pretty basic. Um, and then the other, which is a little more subtle, is understanding feature density. So in using a visual inertial odometry system, the camera needs to be able to extract uh, what's called a feature, which is really an element of the contrast of a surface, the dark light contrast of a surface. So you want enough of those features that something can be recognized as a unique area. Like you wouldn't, a, a purely white wall is very difficult to recognize. So if you put some speckles on it, you can recognize where you are in relation to the wall. But at the same time, if you add too many features, you're essentially creating another solid color, right? If I added speckles and I just kept throwing speckles on something, gradually they would become so dense that it would become a uniform color, right? So that's the significance of feature density, is that in relation to the position of the user, you want the apparent features of the scene to be usable by the camera, right? And again, our focus, what we can actually do, is look at the user experience and the workflow in these environments. And I think the other, just a comment about human factors is probably more so than a lot of applications because AR using things like depth sensing um, is using a lot of hardware resources. It's using multiple cameras simultaneously. It's running an IMU at very high frequencies. And it tends to use very computationally intensive algorithms. You're really stressing everything. I mean, it's like you turn everything up to 11 
and ask the device to run this experience. So it means that you have to be especially aware of how you design the experience in order to control for the runtime cost of executing all of this sensing. Um, and it really, it's a matter of understanding how to manage memory, how to manage processing. A lot of it has to do with just controlling the area of the experience um, and also managing life cycle, not using a sensor if you don't need to. So if you get into this, just be mindful that you don't want to turn everything on and run at full speed. You actually have to manage how resources are utilized. So I'll give you some basic tips. We only have a few minutes um, about modeling the environment, right? How do you even approach this? <clears throat> My advice is take a look at Vuforia Smart Terrain. It's a feature that we've developed over the past five years to deal with specifically these kinds of applications. And what it does is it provides you a very easy to use API that will enable you to segment areas of the environment and actually use them within a Unity scene. So it provides you with a very useful kind of intelligent representation of things. Um, a lot of it, it enables the dynamic creation of scenes, it structures the environment, it enables, it maps everything into a scene graph so you can navigate it and you can actually find things, which is very useful. Um, and then, you know, it basically just makes it a lot, you, we're handling a lot of the, what would you say, the ugly work that goes into sort of refining the reconstruction so that it's exposed into Unity in a way that you can just start working with it immediately. Really, we turn this into an authoring workflow. There's not really any programming involved. You're doing visual authoring, and it enables you to really focus on just creating the experience without having to get into some of the um, more detailed work around, you know, handling the outputs. And so the significance of doing that is that we're giving you a useful representation of the geometry of the surface, right? We're, we're segmenting everything, we're structuring it. We also bring in semantic information. And that was when you see the card game, the fact that we use Tango, but we also then bring in cards, and each of the cards has a role, that is semantics. It enables you to sort of know what you're looking at, know the significance, and even know intrinsic properties of it. There's, it's very valuable within something like a HoloLens experience or a Tango experience to know the direction of the object you're looking at, which is easy for us to do, but not for a sensing device. So what that means is when you recognize the bottle, you know that this is the top of the bottle. And that enables you to orient the experience based on some known um, element within the scene that you can actually recognize something. So it's very helpful. And this is what we look like in Unity. This is our current version. So again, you bring in a smart train object. The smart train object has a notion of a surface, a prop. A prop is basically an object that sits on a surface. We have kind of a binary logic. Either something is a geometric plane, or it's, it's actually a prop, which means that it has a contour to it. Um, this is a, something we're developing. We're going to come out with a feature for Tango pretty soon as part of our Unity integration. Uh, we're, we're being integrated into Unity. It will be available um, for 2017 too. So you'll be able to install Vuforia with the Unity editor, which is great. Um, and then we're going to bring in a lot of these capabilities for developers in working with Tango, working with HoloLens, which we already support, working with ARKit in the future. That's an enabling technology for us. So all of what I'm talking about, you'll be able to begin experimenting with very soon. And this is the basic you know, sort of handling of information or handling of updates coming from a device, is all you do is you, you register for the surface, and then we're running an update loop. And we're looking at all the, whether it's a mesh update coming from reconstruction, a positional update coming from the, the uh, visual inertial odometry system. We present that back into the Unity environment. We map it into a scene graph. And we update all of the objects of your scene automatically. Right. So again, that's how we can work with visual authoring, is all of this is kind of handled under the hood. And as that information is coming in, you can apply Real-time filters, meaning I just want all of the surfaces that are horizontal. I don't care about the vertical surfaces. Don't give me those. Or maybe vice versa. Or I only want all the props. I don't need the surfaces. Just give me things like this. And it enables you to basically apply a filter to the output coming from the device. You can also look at the scene later and query it and say, find me all surfaces that intersect with the wall. And what you want then is you actually want where the floor meets the wall so that maybe you can bounce something against the floor, bounce it against the wall, and catch it, something like that. Um, and then it basically graph updates. But that's the principle. You know, so hopefully this is helpful for you guys. But again, I think the thing to focus on and the problem that needs to be solved for creating AR apps in real-world environments is really around designing effective user experiences. I'd like that, for, if you take anything away from this, there's a lot of technology. 
there's a lot that we're enabling, but it's really up to the developer community to come up with practices and principles for creating these kinds of experiences. And that's what I hope to see. This is something we're going to probably address in future talks as we introduce this technology. You know, but I'd encourage you to start experimenting. Maybe start playing with our current version of Smart Train. Thank you.